What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Sullivan, and guess what? It's draft week. NFL draft just a few days away, kicking off in Detroit on Thursday night, and all these teams are getting their draft boards in order, and you and I at home, we're going to get our betting bets in order, and to do that, we have a star-studded lineup of sports lines finest, RJ White, Alex Selznick, a.k.a. Prop Stars, and of course, the betting in draft expert, Emery Hunt. Fellas, how are we doing? Doing good. It's good to see you, Sully. I haven't talked to you in a while. I know. Um, how hope, we you're doing? Doing, hope you're doing good. Yeah, we're. you know what? We're hanging in there. I, I got the Patriots at number three. I'm hoping that they just stay in pat and take a quarterback, but we'll see and we'll discuss that as we keep going here. And if you like winning picks, by the way, subscribe to sportsline.com. You can use the code PICK to get your first month for $1 as a Sportsline subscriber. It is well worth it beyond the $1. You'll make your money back pretty much instantaneously because of these guys right here, and we'll get into it. The last episode on the feed is myself, John Breach, and Will Brinson. We answered your questions in a mailbag episode. We also kind of got into an AI-powered mock draft, which, as you might expect, was pretty remarkable. Jaden Daniels not in the first round in that mock draft. I don't know if there's betting odds for that, but if there are, I, I don't know if these guys would recommend it. But you guys gathered here a few weeks ago, basically about a month ago, to look at some of the early odds for the NFL draft. But now with it being days away, we're going to kind of fine-tune and look at some best bets here. And of course, as you all know, these betting lines will change. They are subject to change between now, as of this recording, Monday, April 22nd, and when we kick things off on Thursday night in Detroit. So of course, make sure you're looking at your books, make sure you're looking at those odds before you decide to tail. But with all that said, let's get into it and let's start off with the number one overall pick, which is probably more likely than not, the betting odds are overwhelming that it's going to be Caleb Williams minus 20,000. But of course, you're not going to bet that. But let's see if we can find some stuff to bet with Caleb Williams. And first up, let's look at offensive rookie of the year. RJ, is, is this a, a spot where you would go with Caleb Williams at plus 350 or do you like something else with Williams? I think the odds uh, make sense for him to be the favorite. I don't know that I'm going to play him at plus 350, but, you know, it's probably going to end up being fine value. I think it's it'll be lower than that by the time we get to week one. So if you want to play it now, I think that's fine. It's also a situation where we know where he's going to end up. And a lot of these guys, we don't know where they're going to end up, um, you know. And if you want to play that uncertainty, you know, I, I like Brian Thomas as a sleeper at 20 to 1. Um, initially expected him to be in the 15, 16 range market has pounded him over. He might get down to like 20. He's juiced to we'll go get over, get to it in a second. He's juiced to go over 19 and a half right now. Um, that makes it easier for the bills to trade up for him. And the bills need a number one receiver. And if he's the number one receiver in Buffalo catching pass from Josh Allen, he's going to put up stats. So I think he he's a good value at 20 to one. If they can't get him and they stay at where they are, I think Adonai Mitchell becomes the per, the pivot at 35 to one has a potential receiver one, but it's really going to come down to where these guys land. Yeah, you know, it makes a lot of sense because, again, we don't know where a lot of these guys are going to go. Caleb Williams is the only one we feel very definitive that he will go to the Chicago Bears. Emery, how did you like the way that Chicago crafted their roster this offseason in free agency and obviously trading for Keenan Allen? How did you like those pieces coming together with Williams? And, again, how do you feel about his rookie of the year odds? And like RJ just did, throw out who you like in this one as well. Well, we know it's a quarterback award, right? If the quarterback is doing well on a team, especially the number one overall pick is kind of biased in that way. And I love the fact that they've added a run game. Uh, DeAndre Swift is a fantastic back. They were trending in the right direction last year toward the back end of the season, which I was like, they shouldn't have gotten rid of Justin Fields. But now you add even more talent and a, a pretty talented quarterback. So I can understand why he's a favorite. And if you want to lay something on him right now, why it's plus money for sure. However, we know it's a, a splash kind of award as well, because if you think about what we saw last year, we saw a lot of wild plays from C.J. Stroud, which subsequently led him to bringing his team to the playoffs. So Jaden Daniels, if he goes to Washington, I think there's a, a very good setup for him to have success. So that would be a better value, in my opinion. But I, I just feel like it's going to go to either one of these QBs. But both, if potentially go one and two, are going into really good situations, in my opinion. Proppy, do you jive with that? I do for the most part. Yeah, I think there's obviously we've got some uh, a very deep quarterback class. Jaden Daniels, to me, uh, because of his dual threat capabilities, is going to have success right away. I agree with Emery. Uh, if he uh, winds up on a team like Washington, who's obviously struggled a lot recently, he could really turn around their uh, fortune. 
And uh, yeah, that would be a guy I would look at. I'd also look at someone like Michael Penix as well. I think if he landed, let's say, on Minnesota uh, or uh, Las Vegas, uh, he'd be poised to have a potentially big impact as a rookie. But again, not knowing where these guys are ultimately uh, you know, playing really is going to prevent me from, uh, you know, doing anything more than a sprinkle at this stage. I'd rather wait and see where they land, who's going to emerge, you know, as a clear cut starter. Love where uh, RJ is looking at Brian Thomas as a potential value as well. I just think based on where he's projected to go in that 15 to 25 range, likely going to be on a good team, which would certainly benefit him. And he uh, looks to be uh, potentially have a huge ceiling. So, yeah, I think these are guys are all worth a, a speculative look, but it just really comes down to where they end up getting drafted. And if we want to stick with Caleb Williams and, and try to find something specifically with him in his rookie season, you, you guys make great points about other rookies of the year, but maybe let's look at his regular season total passing yards. The number is set at 3,350 and a half. It's even money. Prop, do you like that, the over? Do you like the under here? And, and, and you could throw in, again, how do you like that they crafted their roster already around Williams, presuming that he's going to be the pick? I really like what Chicago's done, especially on the offensive side of things. Uh, adding a guy uh, like Keenan Allen, who's obviously going to be operating over the middle of the field, close to the line of scrimmage, really going to be a quarterback's best friend there. Uh, having a player as explosive as DJ Moore on the perimeter as well. I thought Cole Komet uh, obviously looks to be a plus starter at tight end, adding DeAndre Swift. So uh, I think this team is poised to be quite a bit better offensively. So I really like all the moves that Chicago made in the offseason. I think Caleb's going to be in a position to have success right away. They'll also get a good feel to know, uh, you know, whether he's uh, the guy that they expect him to be. So love all of the moves. I would definitely lean over. I really think if he gets in 16, 17 games, uh, he's going to eclipse this total of 3,300 3, uh, passing yards. So I typically shy away from season long uh, when it comes to playing overs on season long player props. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely be over or nothing as far as I'm concerned. And Emery, I think that, you know, a variable here which could make this number move a little bit is depending on what Chicago does with their other first round pick. If, if there's a wide receiver at that spot, you would have to assume that they could potentially go down that route to add to that offense and that would move this number, right? Or if they go edge rusher, because again, we know more defense, better defense equals more offense, right? Sure. So it, it kind of can go either way. Uh, well, the, the number that, that really stands out is 17, because that extra game, and we're talking about just under 200 yards passing a game in our Lord's year of the 2024. Like, uh, I feel like he could hit that number. Um, because yeah, he's a scrambler, but he's not necessarily a guy that's going to average, you know, or grab. 600 yards rushing on the ground um he's scrambling kind of like patrick mahomes to throw deep down the field and when you added the weapons around there and like you said if they add another receiver or if they go pass rusher it gets better defense and it gets more possessions i feel like this is a very low number so i would definitely go over and rj you know prop you kind of touched on this as well you know how do you attack these season longs when again the dude isn't even on an nfl team yet and it's in it's april how do you look at this and, and what do you think of this number yeah, they're comfortable putting this number out, though, because they know what team he's going to be on. You wouldn't put this out for, right. for Jaden Daniels at this point because you need to know what offense he's playing in. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, 200 yards per game should be his floor. So if he's playing 17 games, you know, you got to like the over here. The one thing, I, the, you know, to play devil's advocate, the one thing I would caution, that Bears defense was amazing in the second half last year, played very well. So if they are controlling the games and, and, and allow the Bears to win these lower scoring games, and he doesn't have to throw as much, put him more at risk, you know, hand off some, um, he might not get there. You know, if he, if he, he's just not going to have these high volume games. So we'll see if that Bears defense can replicate what they did in the second half of last year. Might bring down his attempt total, which would then, you know, rate, lower his ceiling, obviously, for passing yards. But you got to figure he should get to 200 yards per game. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see how Caleb Williams translates in Chicago and, of course, as the potential, most likely, number one overall pick all right we'll take a quick break and when we come back we're gonna do some new faces but familiar faces when we come back here on the pick six podcast
Welcome back to the Pick 6 Podcast. The last time you guys did this, you did Picks 1 through 8 specifically. So we'll switch it up a little bit. We're going to obviously look at the top 3 overall picks. Top 5, we're going to keep expanding out and look at the exact order for some of these picks. So quickly for the top 3, obviously we're just talking about Caleb Williams. Slam dunk pretty much to go number 1 overall. But number 2 and number 3 are, are where we're going to kind of see a, maybe a little bit of intrigue here. A lot of people believe that Jaden Daniels, the Heisman Trophy winner out of LSU, is going to be earmarked for the Washington Commanders at number three in Drake May going to the Patriots or number three overall in general going one, two, three. That's plus 110, the favorites there. And then you switch Drake May and Jaden Daniels. That's plus 240, and the list goes on. J.J. McCarthy coming in at the number three spot with Drake May or Drake May at number two at plus 850. RJ, how do you look at this top three overall exact order in specifically this past week when they when the commanders brought in all of those quarterbacks and Jaden Daniels' agent wasn't particularly thrilled with how that kind of rolled out? Does that change how you view Jaden Daniels maybe going number two overall? Yeah, it actually does. And as silly as it seems to say, if he is the clear number two guy and like he's head and shoulders above the rest, then it won't matter and they'll take him. But you know, indications are, you know, that he's rated cl close enough to these other guys that I think it can matter. I mean, they just got rid of the Daniel Snyder era. They just got out of that. Yeah, are you going to go right back into having, you know, pot potential drama? A guy has said maybe he doesn't want to play there. All these reports coming out. If there is like any fire to that smoke at all, I, I just think you can't risk having the same old Washington kind of branding coming out of this draft. Um, So, you know, Rick Spielman on this on a CBS Sports podcast with the first pick, I think, has kind of said that he thinks Drake May should be the pick there. So I'm going to go with that. In this, I'm going to go with the upset. The odds had built to Jaden Daniels for much of last week going number two. Crashed down Friday morning as Drake May got a lot of love. We're seeing that start to build up again. Maybe somebody knows something. Maybe it's like last year at when at this time Will Levis was the odds on favor to go number two at minus 120. Obviously, that did not happen. He did not go in the first round. Uh, I'm going to play May here just as a value because um, I don't think the market should be as confident as it is with Daniels going number two. So I'm actually going to pair Williams May with McCarthy at plus 850. Um, some reports suggest Pats are happy with May or Daniels. Elliot Wolf, their, their acting GM, there seems like a big McCarthy fan. I think he'll pound the table for McCarthy if it's between those two guys. I think McCarthy's an easy sell to Robert Kraft as a proven winner, coached by Jim Harbaugh, coming out of the program that that spit out Tom Brady all those years ago. Um, so I think Williams May McCarthy at plus 850 has a better chance of happening than the plus 850 I'd suggest. Emery, how do you see this quarterback top three shaking out? I mean, I, I would lean more strongly to Williams, Daniels, and May um, at plus 110. But I can also see a scenario where the Patriots get creative and try to double dip and really rob the Arizona Cardinals. So I can see this. And, you know, there was not, you know, Williams, Daniels in trade as an option. But I, I can see I can make a case for Williams, Daniels and Marvin Harrison at, at three for the Patriots and then double back in the first round to get somebody that's been uh, undervalued. You know, maybe a Spencer Rattler later in the first round, something like that, or maybe just continue to stockpile weapons and find a guy on day two uh, for you know, the bridge quarterback, Jacoby Brissett, because maybe they don't feel like May or McCarthy are that much of a difference than a Brissett, right? Or maybe they have those two group with the Spencer Rattler, but why pay the premium for that guy? We can get that guy later at a cheaper cost. So I would, I would also sprinkle Williams, Daniels, and Harrison, because I could see a potential trade there, but I also could see the Patriots really taking a receiver. And for plus those at home, that's, that's plus 550. So, uh, but plus 5,500. So, you know, that is, that would be quite the payday if you were able to do that. And obviously, the, the, the counter, I think, for New England would be do you just trade that pick? Do you, do you let those quarterback needy teams like New York or Minnesota, anybody else that would want to move up to number three, and then you gain some more capital? So, it, it'll be fascinating. I mean, Elliot Wolf did say last week the Patriots were open for business. So, so, Proppy, how do you kind of see? these second and third picks shaken out yeah this is a market that i look to attack uh once we have a little bit more information or cl as close to the draft really as possible i really just think there's such a potential wide range of outcomes you know really after caleb williams going first overall uh, i do think uh i wouldn't shock me whatsoever if new england traded out of pick three i think that's 
at least on the table, and there's a certain likelihood where that happens. Uh, I also think there's a really good chance we see J.J. McCarthy uh, entering into the top three or going third uh, overall as well. So I'd probably be looking at some – but uh, long shots, really, with Caleb obviously going first, and then second, Jaden Daniels, third, uh, JJ McCarthy. Uh, and then I think there's, you know, inverse is that as well, where we see, um, yeah, just even JJ McCarthy going as high as number two overall. So, really, when I'm looking at this, I, I am trying to be as patient as possible, gather as much information as I possibly can, uh, but I'm going to really look to attack the really big long shots here. Yeah, because it is it is tough because, like you said, RJ, like you know, it, this time last year it felt like the the wave was going for Will Levis, and then all of a sudden that that dude completely falls out of the first round. So it's tough to try to discern what is actually real and what is just you know draft day smoke that turns into nothing. So it, it will be fascinating to see how those first two picks shape out. Real quickly, we'll kind of expand it to top five overall, and I think that this is pretty fascinating we've talked JJ McCarthy here a little bit already but he is the betting favorite to go five overall in this scenario with Williams Daniels May Marvin Harrison Jr. to the Cardinals or anybody at number four and then McCarthy at number five obviously the Los Angeles Chargers have their quarterback in Justin Herbert they have the fifth overall pick so RJ it is it is kind of crazy to me to have the the betting favorite scenario here to be a trade-up because that's really the only scenario where this makes sense right yeah, the actual market for the number five pick doesn't have McCarthy favored. I think it has okay. Malik Neighbors favored um, and McCarthy at like plus 450. But McCarthy, as we'll get into, it is favored to be a top five pick somewhere. So, so you know, for that to happen, it's probably going to be a trade up. In my scenario where he goes to New England, I like the pick of Williams, May, McCarthy, Daniels at number four and Harrison at number five. If I'm right about the top three, Daniels is a great fit for Brian Dayball. Um, and, and, you know, to build him up like he did with Josh Allen, I think that's a great landing spot for Daniels, too. And they're going to maximize his potential there. And uh, the cards will be happier moving down to six than 11 and, and falling out of that range for a blue chip talent. Um, I also think the call cards, if they do that, call up the Chargers and get them to flip five for six just to make sure they get Harrison. I think the Chargers are a team that, uh, you know, people will project them in this situation with uh, four quarterbacks go. Oh, they got Marvin Harrison. That's that's amazing. You know, how could they have this opportunity? I think Jim Harbaugh wants an offensive lineman. I think Alt might be the pick at five in a more traditional top four where Harrison goes number four anyway, if they can't trade the pick. Um, so in order to flip five to six and take all it's, it's six and get some extra draft capital, I think they'll be okay with that. That's why I like Williams, May, McCarthy as my top three at plus 850. But if you're going to do that, just expand it to Daniels and Harrison at plus 3,100. No, that, that makes all the sense in the world. And in Emory, you know, there is a scenario here, right, where this just goes chalk. Like we're talking trade-ups. We're talking, you know, Minnesota, New York, swapping picks. There is a world where – everybody just stays put and, and makes their picks. Do you see that happening? And does that lend yourself to maybe go with the, you know, plus 700 option with Williams, Daniels, May, Harrison, neighbors, or, or how do you view this top five? Well, it's interesting because I would love to call Jim Harbaugh's bluff. You said all is about JJ McCarthy, the best quarterback in the draft. Take him at five. I dare you to take him. Right. Uh, but in all seriousness, I'm shocked that we don't see an option where neighbors goes ahead of Harrison jr. Uh, because here's the thing. We've seen this before. Remember the year where you had Jamison Williams, Henry Ruggs, and Jalen Waddle come out? We just assumed Jamison Williams was the best one, and Waddle and Ruggs ended up going first out the trio. So what if a team like Arizona feels as though Neighbors is the better receiver, and he goes four um, and, and pairs up with Michael Wilson, who they have already in, in, in tow? So I, I find that fascinating. Um, so this was a tougher one for me because the Chargers could also this that's the ultimate wild card because I could even see them taking Brock Bowers, right? Harbaugh was like, hey man, we need a point of attack player. It fits. We need a pass catcher. It fits. Um, so this one was a little bit tougher for me because of the Harrison married at four and or married as the number one receiver. So if I had to lean one away, it would probably be the chalky one of Williams Daniels, May Harrison neighbors. No, that's again, it's it's fascinating to see how this goes. And, and Proppy, you mentioned this, you know, you want to have all this information, right? You want to know everything. And it, it, it's so hard to try to, like I was saying, discern what's real and what's not. So when you look at this top five, is there anything that you're picking up on? 
Nothing that I see. I did want to hit on a couple of things. So I do think, uh, to Emery's point, I know RJ uh, likes this a bit as well because we've talked about this uh, off stream, is that I believe a lot of teams will have Malik Neighbors as their number one wide receiver prospect over Marvin Harrison. Uh, I just think what he offers, you know, certain teams will fall in love with his quick twitch, the explosiveness, uh, the ability to win downfield, the separation. Uh, So I've just been so impressed uh, throughout this process, just uh, learning more about Malik Neighbors as a prospect, watching him, I, I firmly believe that quite a few teams uh, will have him ahead of Marvin Harrison on their big board. But frankly, I, I think some teams uh, may even have uh, Marvin Harrison as their third wide receiver prospect potentially as well. Uh, I think there is a serious gap between the two. So I I certainly think it's in play for Malik Neighbors to go in the top five as early as fourth or even third overall, frankly, if a team decides uh, to trade up. So I'm looking at these scenarios. uh, I I definitely am sprinkling on the likelihood or the potential, I should say, or the long shot potential uh, of Malik Neighbors potentially uh, being drafted in that top five. And and Harry has one that he highlighted on FanDuel right here where it was the top five exact order of Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy going at number four. And then Malik Neighbors, that's plus 4,100. So maybe something to kind of keep an eye out there. You were were talking, Proppy, about being top five overall. Well, let's just look at Neighbors really quick. He's plus 155 compared to a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. who's minus 1,800. That, That, to me, screams value. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Certainly in the top five. Yeah, I I think it really boils down to uh, what teams are looking for. And I I firmly believe that there are plenty of teams that will value uh, sort of the skill set that Malik Neighbors offers. He's he's such an explosive prospect athletically. uh, Just so impressed with him. I look at Marvin Harrison. uh, He's a great prospect in his own right, but more of a technician, uh, the route running. Just doesn't have the, the the same you know explosiveness downfield that a guy like Malik Neighbors has. So uh, yeah, I, I do believe that there is value on Malik Neighbors going top five. I think uh, all, all bets are off the table as far as uh, teams potentially trading up uh, to land his services. And I think there's a strong likelihood uh, that a high percentage of teams will have him rated as their number one wide receiver on their boards. And RJ, you mentioned offensive line with the Chargers a little bit earlier. Is Joe Walt at plus 270 to be top five? Is that something you're looking at? Um, It's not a good value. I think the better value is to take him number five overall at plus 400. I don't think there's a situation where he goes top four. But, you know, why? so why play the top five number when you can just take him fifth at, right. at, at plus 400 if you think the Chargers are going to go that direction? That being said, plus 400 is a pretty good value for, for a direction a lot of people think the Chargers are going to go if they can't engineer a trade down. Or if the trade happens above them with the Cardinals at four, like I, I proposed with the Giants, um, and they're stuck there, do they take the receiver or do they wait on the receiver in a class with a lot of depth at receiver and go with Joe Alt? I know the, the class has a lot of depth at offensive tackle too, but um, you know we expect 10 offensive linemen to go in the first round. I mean, there might not be great options when they pick in the second round. So um, could easily be Alt at number four, uh, at number five here. I think the only other option in the top five market is to look at J.J. McCarthy. I mean, the speculation has been, is he going to get go top five? His number to go under five and a half has danced around minus 150, minus 160. At some places, it's come down a little bit. Um, so, depending on what value you're getting there, you know, if you can get it around the minus 120 range, I would think about it. But minus 150, I'm probably not playing it and just, you know, expecting the trade. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, Emery, and that's what I was going to bring up to you is the fact that you're banking on a trade, which it just feels like that is such a, a, a big risk to take for somebody to go in top five, as much as it's been mocked a million times that this could happen. We just don't know if it's physically going to happen at this point. So is there anybody you can throw JJ McCarthy in there? Is there anybody in top five that you like? He's not listed, but Troy Fatano, the tackle of Washington, you know, when he checked out with the length of arms that everyone so covets, uh, and you combine that box being checked with his on-field tape, it's like, wow, maybe he's the best offensive lineman. Alt has the lineage and has the, the requisite size. Uh, but, you know, when you think about how well someone can move and be athletic and deal with the twitchier, you know, edge rushers, some people still say it's a, it's a big man's game. Uh, but Fatanu would be one that I would probably sprinkle a little bit on. But, I mean, it's hard not to go uh, with RJ's logic because that makes so much sense. The value is just better. If you think he goes five, just take the higher uh, odds there or the better odds there as opposed to the minimal odds you get here at plus 270. 
Well, I'll, I'll just stick with you as we kind of expand this to top 10. I, I have Fatanu right here at plus 550 to be a top 10 pick. Is that something that you look at? And, and as you expand to top 10, is there anybody else that you like? Yeah, I would say he would be one that I would definitely uh, lean into. Um, it's it's a shame because I feel like um, the way people talk about Leatu Latu, you know, they act as if he's not going to be a top 10 pick. So is is the football side of me is glad to see the odds very small because that kind of says, okay, maybe he's in play for Chicago or someone like that, um, or even Tennessee who needs a, a pass rusher as well. Uh, but right now the best odds would either be Fashanu or Fatanu, uh, Fashanu or Fatanu right there um, at tackle. Because whoever starts, whoever takes the first receiver, we'll see a run on receivers, right? Whoever takes the first tackle, we'll see a run on tackle. So if, if we're banking on a guy going fifth and Joe Alt, that means Tennessee needs a tackle. Giants, you could convince them they need a lineman, they need a lot of things. Um, the Falcons can get younger and a little bit more talent uh, at, at tackle. You know, that that's a case to be made there. Um, and the Jets could potentially use a tackle. So we'll probably see a run on maybe one or two tackles after Alt is taken. No, it's true. It's it's very offensive driven draft, especially at the top. I mean, we're talking about possibly like one defensive player taken in the top 10, if that in certain situations, depending on what Atlanta and Chicago does with their second first round pick. RJ, how are you looking at the defensive guys? I'm looking Dallas Turner here on my page is, pl uh, you know, 10, plus 100 to be the first uh, or be a top 10 player. A lot two is plus 170. Jared Verse plus 230. Are you looking at the defensive guys at all? Yeah, it's interesting. The, mar the the mock drafts have all pegged Dallas Turner number eight for the longest time. Um, and that's the fit. Him to Atlanta. Just, you know, write it down in pen. Don't think about it. Um, I've always I've been under the impression Atlanta likes uh, Layatu Latu. And I think he just fits what Raheem Morris wants to do defensively. And um, we've seen those odds, uh, you know, connecting the two drop. We saw Leatu Latu go from a long shot to be the first defender drafted to around plus 230 last week. Um, today, on Monday, we saw a big change in the odds for number eight. We saw him move in most markets, either being tied for the favorite or some a little bit of the favorite over Turner for, for the number eight pick. And so maybe a little bit behind. So I think a lot of smoke there to say Latu could be a number a top 10 picks. I like taking him at plus 170, even if he's not the option for Atlanta A. He could be an option for Chicago at nine to help their pass rush. Also, don't rule out Byron Murphy at plus 250 here. His stock is on the rise in the betting market. Really, you know, considered like he could slip because, you know, there's not many teams that have defensive linemen as their top need. So when you go connecting players to teams in mock drafts, you look at offensive line here, offensive line there, and where does Murphy go? A lot of people project him down to like, you know, 18 on the Bengals. But the market has been betting him under, betting him under. He's now favored to go under 14 and a half. I think there's a solid chance he's the first defender drafted. Could even be as early as A to Atlanta um, would be a major presence in the middle of that line because what he does is attacking from the interior is very hard to find and can really be a game-changing uh, thing for a defense. So those are the two guys I'm looking at, Latu and Byron Murphy. And Proppy, you know, I'll just bring up Brock Bowers plus 135. I feel like a lot of people have mocked him to go to the Jets at number 10 as a possible option. I know they need a tackle as well. Is he somebody that you think is worthy of a top 10 pick? Do you think that's a good bet or, or is there another guy on the board that you like here? Yes, as far as Bowers is concerned, I love him as a prospect. I don't really see – I see his, uh, his ceiling basically going, you know, to the Jets at 10. I'd be sh shocked if he went higher than that. Uh, as far as other guys to go in the top 10, uh, I love where RJ's at. Uh, with Byron Murphy uh, as a prospect, I think he's uh, got a great chance to be the first defensive player drafted, uh, certainly in play in the top 10 as well. I also love Latu, what he brings. I think he's got a great chance to also be uh, the first defensive player drafted. Uh, so rather than, you know, potentially some of these guys, or at least Latu uh, and Murphy being a top 10 pick, I'd also look to potentially attack it from the standpoint of being the first defender uh, off the board there. Uh, typically, you can find greater odds uh, on some of that uh, on that market versus just locking them in to pick eight, nine, or ten. Uh, so, yeah, I like Latu uh, potentially going to Atlanta as well as comparing him as a prospect uh, to Dallas Turner. I feel like if the medical uh, wasn't a, uh, the, the medical was really what's preventing Latu from uh, being far and away, in my opinion, the superior prospect. If we look at the production in college, his ability to close on the quarterback as well, I think he's much further along 
uh, from a technical standpoint uh, than a guy like Dallas Turner, who athletically is really impressive, but the production really hasn't caught up uh, with some of his physical tools. So uh, outside of the top 10, I, I'd be really looking to attack, at least with the defenders in this, uh, the first defender drafted, specifically pinpointing uh, Byron Murphy Jr. And, and Latu as well as the two likeliest candidates. No, it's an important distinction that you guys all point out. Like if it correlates and you're like, okay, this dude's going to be a top 10 pick. Well then, okay, let's, let's see what his odds are for top defender or first defender off the board. And if you can get better odds there, again, shop around, see if you can get a good price there. Because, again, the logic correlates. It all makes the, it makes sense. You just got to see what you can get in terms of value. All right, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll do a different kind of prop. We'll do some over-unders and also see if we can identify Mr. Irrelevant. Obviously been a factor the last few years with Brock Purdy in San Francisco. So stick around. One last shot to seal their fate. Who will earn the chance to be champions? It's the Copa Italia semifinals on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. I, I know we did just talk a little bit about the defensive players, but really this is supposed to be an offensive heavy draft. And we're going to do our best to try to balance it out in terms of talking about both sides of the ball as possible. And we'll continue to talk about the defense with the defensive rookie of the year odds. And, and unlike when we were talking about the offensive rookie of the years, we have zero clue where any of these players are going to go. We know Caleb Williams going to Chicago. That was about it. Now we have zero clue about who is going where. So RJ, you know, how much does that impact your decision making here? Is it does that make you not want to touch any of these players? Or is there somebody that is presenting good value now because he doesn't have his team yet? Yeah, I, I don't think it's really scheme spe specific for some of these guys. Like Latu, I think is going to rack up sacks wherever he goes. So I think he's a good value right now at plus 700. Um, wherever he ends up, I think it's going to be good value. I'm going to throw out a major sleeper here. We were going to talk round one picks, didn't have time to do it. I was going to bring this guy up there. Um, I'm going to bring him up now for defensive rookie of the year, Junior Colson, plus 6,000 potential tackle machine for the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle is a team that is a trade down candidate. They're always a trade down candidate. They have surprised before with a round one linebacker going with Jordan Brooks when he had Bobby Wagner on the, on the, the, the team. Um, and linebacker is now a massive long-term need with Brooks and Wagner both gone. Signed Tyrell Dotson, signed Jerome Baker. They're both on one-year deals. There's no nobody um, to, to build the defense around long-term. And Colson's the type of leader, played a key role on Mike McDonald's defense as a freshman, can be his defensive caps in the building round, can be the guy that makes that, de that defense move for McDonald. I think if they can trade down, he's going to prioritize getting um, Junior Colson for his team. And teams like Dallas, Green Bay, Arizona, Buffalo could all be trade-up options to get to number 16, picking offensive linemen, defenders if you're if you're Green Bay. Um, Arizona, I think, with all their draft capital, can move up, take Marvin Harrison number four, then move up for a defender in that 16 range. Buffalo obviously needs a receiver. Seattle gets down in the, in the 20s, especially the late 20s. I think Junior Colson's in play is around one pick. Starts from day one in Seattle, put, piles up a bunch of tackles, talked about it with his leadership and, and all these glowing phrases, and he's now in the mix at plus 6,000 to be the rookie of the year. I love that, RJ. Giving us some value here as we come out of the break. I, I think that that's going to be a fantastic situation to monitor as we go through the draft and obviously throughout the rookie season there. Emery, you know, you mentioned earlier that, the you know, the Offensive Rookie of the Year is a quarterback award. Do you view that in a similar sense with Defensive Rookie of the Year with edge rushers piling up sacks? And, and how do you view this rookie class in this award? Yeah, it's a sacks-driven award, man. And I, I feel like what's also unique about it is that it's a – sense of timing type of award too because people are creatures of habit we tend to you know remember what we saw last and if you remember only big moments in primetime games i'm thinking jared verse will have those splash plays because he had them at florida state and so even though i'm a big fan a lot too he's my number one edge rusher i think verse has better value here because he has a great sense of timing of knowing when to make the big play and we all know how we all are watching primetime games and watching every the, the the moments this dude always tends to show up in the moments and i feel like that's going to give him even though he may have lesser sacks than a lot to but the moments are what people are going to remember and they're going to lean on that when they vote for rookie of the year so i think he'll get it yeah no i think like Devin witherspoon had a bunch of moments last year too and it felt like he was generating a little bit of buzz obviously didn't win the award it, it, you know proppy is it tough to go defensive back here because it's just you're really banking on interceptions. It's just such a fickle kind of stat to try to, you know, pinpoint. And, and how do you view this here? 
Uh, I, I I think ordinarily it is difficult to go with defensive backs, but there is a defensive back that I absolutely love who is my favorite uh, candidate to win, at least at this stage. Uh, it's Cooper DeGene. I've just been uh, riding shotgun. I've just been so impressed uh, with Cooper DeGene as a prospect, uh, especially coming off of that phenomenal pro day. Uh, he wasn't able to participate at the combine, uh, wasn't medically cleared after fracturing his fibula, I believe, in November had a pro day just a few weeks ago, uh, tested off the charts athletically. I love what he offers with his ability uh, to play multiple positions, just tremendous versatility. Uh, reminds me a lot of Tyron Matthew, um, a bigger, uh, faster version of Tyron Matthew, just a very instinctive football player. You can line him up outside, inside. Uh, he could play a safety. He could play nickel. He could play outside. Uh, I think he's going to be uh, a phenomenal chess piece uh, for a uh, a de uh, defensive minded coach. It's going to be very happy to select him in the top 20 picks. Uh, if he landed on a team like Minnesota, if they were, for instance, uh, to take him, I think he would be a tremendous fit there. Uh, but yeah, I just think Cooper DeGene offers so much versatility. He's going to make a huge impact, and I like his potential to potentially win uh, Defensive Player of the Year or Rookie of the Year. And he's plus 1,600, so we got a plus 1,600. Even Jared Verse, plus 850, and obviously RJ's plus 6,000. So, so definitely some good value across the board there. But now let's look at some pivotal figures in this draft because we all know it's all names and, and who's who and, and who's going where. And so we're going to do a little bit of over-unders in terms of where are some of these players in the range of will they'll be drafted? We've talked about them a bunch. We'll start with J.J. McCarthy. His draft position over under is set at five and a half. The over is at plus 116. The under at minus 154. As we mentioned, RJ, you're kind of banking on a trade here. How do you view this? Yeah, now we're getting to the good stuff, the stuff I've been tracking over at Sportsline over the last week um, of how these odds have moved. Um, he has been trending under here. That has scaled back over the last day or two. Um, his under position has come down a little bit. A circuit drop is under to minus 125. I think under is a play if you're getting juice around minus 125, not really looking to play it at minus 150. Okay. Uh, Emery, how do you see J.J. McCarthy, and where do you think he ultimately comes off the board? I feel like the football side will, 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 reign, will, will get itself right. And stop overdrafting quarterbacks. So I feel like the over is a good value here. Um, Minnesota at 11, if they value him as the 11th best player in the class, they won't have to move because anything higher than, in my opinion, second round is, is way overpriced. Um, so I will say over. I, I think folks will have to understand that you know, we'll have to let cooler heads prevail and draft first round talents in the first round. I'm hoping. Is it, a, is it a Will Levis situation, Emery? I, I think his – obviously there's that trio of, of, of stack that need quarterbacks that right now as they sit, Vikings, Raiders, and Broncos, I think that would be his floor within 11 to 13 um, because I can't see uh, – I mean, when you talk – I'm old school. When you say top five, I always reference the 1989 draft of Aikman, Barry Sanders, Deion Sanders, Derek Thomas. You don't want to be the Tony Manders in the situation. But when you look at those uh, that those four, those five, man, that's a top five. I don't feel like McCarthy is of that uh, caliber. Yeah, and I just keep holding to the fact that it, you still have to have a blockbuster trade to happen. And, and, and I know that you know Minnesota is armed with two first rounders and a bunch of other assets, but that is still a huge hurdle to cross at a certain point. So you know maybe there is some value here, Profi. How do you view it? I think he's overrated as a prospect. I totally get what Emery is saying, but I just uh, seen too many tea leaves, in my opinion, that suggest that he's going to be uh, a top five pick. So I agree with RJ as far as the price point is concerned. Uh, nothing I'm looking to, to bet at, at the current number, uh, but I do ultimately think a team who is quarterback needy will take him top five. So uh, I think he goes under. Well, speaking of quarterbacks, we haven't talked about Michael Penix Jr. yet, and, and I'm kind of dying to talk about him because I think that he's one of the more mysterious players in this draft. I mean, we had Jonathan Jones at CBS Sports do a mock draft, and he went number eight overall to the Atlanta Falcons. You've seen other mocks where he's going outside the first round and anywhere in between that. So his over-under is set appropriately at 32.5. The over, so him dipping into the second round, is at plus 134, the under minus 180. RJ, how do you view Michael Penix in, in, in his kind of uncertain draft status? Yeah, in our odds tracker, he has trended massively toward the under since his release. This was minus 190 to the over less than a week ago, and now it's very heavily juiced to the under. 
Um, I like playing over plus 180 at DraftKings in case the age and the medicals cause his stock to be more Will Levis than anything. But I do also like following that JJ train, sprinkling on him to go eight or nine as a trade up spot for Minnesota, Denver, Vegas, in case the buzz is warranted, in case the Giants are the ones that end up with Daniels and these teams that really need quarterbacks have to figure something out. And they start, you know, kind of, you know, looking at each other like who's going to blink first? You know, are we going to have to move up and head in Minnesota to get this guy? Um, so I think there's a couple different ways you can play Penix. You can play the over on 32 and a half in case, you know, all this is smoke. And then you can also play in the top 10, which I think even just a top 10 pick might be like 29 to one last time I saw it. So if you just don't even want to put, put him in a, at a, at a, you know, one single slot and take him to get traded anywhere, eight, nine, 10, um, you know, I think that's an option too. Well, Emery, you mentioned the floor for JJ McCarthy kind of being in that, you know, 11, 12, 13 range. And, and there's a lot of quarterback needy teams there. Again, as it stands, 11 Minnesota, 12 Denver, 13 Vegas, you could say 14 New Orleans possibly, and then 16 with Seattle as well. Do you see Penix going in that range or do you see maybe him taking a flyer at him going inside that top 10 or maybe just, you know, trading up to 10 with New York to possibly leapfrog those teams? Or do you see him falling out of this first round entirely? It's unique because I feel like, you know, specifically he fits the Raiders. So that's what pick 14. Um, so I see him at 14, 13, but I also yeah, see 13. 13. I see him at 13, but I also see a highly likely situation where you get a team that tries to, you know, play both sides of the fence, double dip like the Giants. Hey, we're at six. Let's take an elite level receiver and let's double back in the first round to get a guy that we can see help us out at QB. They can get him the ball down the field. Um, that's an option like him, somebody trading back into the first round. I think Penix goes around pick 28 to 31, not to the teams that are currently sitting at 20 to 31, but I feel like that's where we'll see Michael Penix go, almost like a Lamar Jackson situation where Baltimore d jumped back uh, at pick 32 and robbed him. So I will go over here because I feel like he'll go first round, but it'll be late and somebody will trade back into the first to get him. And, and Proppy, I, I think it's a little overrated at times when we talk about it, but everybody says, well, you got to trade back into the bottom of the first round to get that fifth year option on, especially on a quarterback. It, does that make sense here? And, and do you jive with these guys that, you know, it seems pretty clear that he's going to be a first round pick. Uh, I, I do think it does make some sense. Although I love Penix's chances to be a first round pick, particularly, I think he has a great chance to go in the top 15 pick. It's been one of my favorite uh, plays that I've been on uh, over the last couple of weeks. It's just Penix landing uh, in the first round, but I think he's just done so much to help his draft stock uh, really over the last couple of months. Uh, uh, did wonderful at the combine, the private workout circuit as well, did very well. He's met with the teams. I just heard uh, just glowing feedback when teams have gotten a closer look or had them uh, in the building. So I just think with the amount of quarterback needy teams we have, particularly in that range, uh, an 11 to 15, uh, there are going to be teams that fall in love with Michael Penix. And I just think he's a great shot to go in the top 15. I think he's a near lock personally to be a first round pick. So you're the one you're right. the one that's been moving this market, huh? Yeah. Poppy? I, I knew somebody was with yeah. this big swing. I was like, I think Proppy's behind this one. <laughs> And then the other quarterback that we want to quickly mention is Bo Nix. His draft position, 32 and a half. Same thing as, as Michael Penix, but the odds totally different. The over minus 210, the under 32 and a half plus 154. RJ, do you see him as a first round pick? It's basically been one way action in the market on the over circuit has actually moved their line to 34 and a half and it's still minus 175 on the over. I think the under at plus 170 at DK is the value. Broncos are the clear favorite to take him still. Everybody might think that's a perfect match. Um, they don't have a second round pick, so they're not going to do it in round two unless they make a trade. I think more likely is that they, if they can't trade up for a quarterback and they don't have, you know, the, the second round pick to, to help them do it, I think they can trade down to the twenties and take Knicks there. Um, I think you could sprinkle a little bit on him to end up in Minnesota or Vegas at plus 600 each to cover your bases on, on the Denver trade up scenario. But um, I think pairing those with an under at plus 170 um, and thinking Denver finds a way to get down to the twenties to take him is, is the way to go. And Emery, you were saying, you know, you hope that first round talent is stays in the first round. Do you view him as a first round talent? And then where do you see him? Do you see him going? I don't. And, and I think he, I think the over is super juiced uh, because of it, but I just I would probably stay away from this one. I think he's more of a second round talent, and that's fine. Listen, Andy Dalton, Colin Kaepernick, we've seen second round quarterbacks, you know, get drafted 
and have success. And so I think that's where, you know, we've seen way too much of Bo Nix at Auburn to try to, you know, forget what we just watched at, at Oregon. It's a different situation with Michael Penix at Indiana. We saw him be a reason why Indiana was in a lot of those games. They're not a football factory. But being a football factory at Auburn and seeing why they was losing some of those games, it's hard to erase that. I think teams would kind of still, you know, penalize Bo Nix for that. So I see him as more of a second-round guy. And then, Proppy, do you do you kind of follow that same mindset? Or because, you know, it's a quarterback and teams always get needy for these quarterbacks that you might want to sprinkle something on that under? Uh, it's interesting to me. I think it's a polar. He's a polarizing prospect in a lot of ways, but I, I agree with Emery. I personally view him uh, as more of a second round prospect. If I'm looking at uh, the top quarterbacks here, potentially falling out of the first round, he uh, uh, included with the other guys we've discussed, he'd be the most likely candidate. That being said, again, a quarterback uh, driven league. And there's teams with, you know, clear needs at quarterback. So wouldn't shock me. What's interesting is I think there's going to be a scenario where uh, if the Broncos potentially pass on him in the top 15, uh, then I could see him going all the way to the early to mid second round. So I think a lot hinges on what happens early, how things shake out with a guy like Penix, where he ends up going. Uh, so ultimately, I'd lean over. It wouldn't surprise me for him to go under. Nothing I have very strong conviction on, though. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Again, if the board stays where it is in the second round, a lot of these teams at the top, Carolina, New England, Arizona, Washington, L.A., Tennessee, Green Bay, Houston, they all kind of have their quarterback needs filled. It, unless Vegas doesn't have a quarterback in the first round, maybe them at 44, 45 with New Orleans. Again, it'll be fascinating to see how, you know, what range he goes in. Emery, do you got something to say there? Team to keep an eye on is a team we hadn't seen in the first round in a while, and that's the Rams. Stafford mm. can't play forever, so that would be one tricky spot where a quarterback can go. No, it's, it's a good point, and they are number 52 overall in the second round, and of course, number 19. Hello, Rams in the first round. Haven't seen that in a while. Pick a 19th overall. The next prospect I want to talk about, you know, you guys were talking a little bit about him before we jumped on here. Roma Dunze, his draft position, and so RJ, right now, it's over eight and a half, the over is plus 124, the under eight and a half, minus 166. Where do you view him? Yeah, the mocks have consistently put him at number nine with Chicago. The market has consistently put him under eight and a half, and both of those things can't be right, obviously. Atlanta could be a good trade spot for someone to come and get him at number eight. Um, the value to me is just playing the plus 135 on the over, not banking on a trade. You know, trade ups are more common to pay pay that premium draft capital to get it for a quarterback than a receiver, um, especially the third receiver in the class by by you know a lot of a lot of uh, evaluators, um, you know, boards. So even though you know some some have him two, some might even have him one. Um, but you know, I think it's more likely he goes nine uh, or ten to the Jets, unless the Jets can make a small trade up to to eight to get him for Atlanta. Right. This was the number that kind of stuck out to me, Emery. It, it, it just feels like, you know, we're going to get a lot of quarterbacks in the first, definitely the first three picks, possibly four in the first five. That's going to just push a Dunze down if we look at him as the number three wide receiver as opposed to Harrison and neighbors and then a Dunze. Is that your order? And where do you see him in this eight and a half spot? What, what makes it tricky is the fact that we don't know what the Cardinals are going to do. We, we are under the assumption that the I mean, not the Cardinals, the Chargers. We under the assumption that the Chargers will, I mean, the Cardinals will take a receiver. Cool. But charge uh, Chargers need a receiver. The uh, Giants need a receiver. You know, Tennessee, you can kind of, even though they need offensive line help, there's never a downside to add more talent around your young quarterback. Um, Falcons could even double dip and get another receiver. Like, so we could literally see the run on receivers start right after the, the third quarterback or fourth quarterback is taken. So this is a tough one, man. It, it seems easy on the surface. I agree with RJ. I feel like the jets are ideally the spot for him. Um, but I mean, it, it puts it, it puts it tough in play. This is probably one pick. I would probably lean more of him being a top 10 pick than, than to decide whether or not to go over or under eight and a half. Is that how you would kind of view this proppy is to maybe just try to attack as a top 10 as opposed to this eight and a half? Uh, I'm not very bu as bullish as uh, I think 
some other mocks or um, even my, maybe my colleagues are on a Dunze. I think there's a good chance he falls out of the top 10. I'm personally not. Uh, I like the over here quite a bit. I want to preface by stating that, but I think a lot of teams don't have him maybe as their third uh, overall wide receiver. I think Brian Thomas uh, Jr. LSU uh, will be that third prospect for a lot of teams. If we look at a Dunze, I just think he, uh, if we're talking about the, at least the top three wide receivers, he has uh, by far the furthest to go to reach his ceiling. Uh, his ability to win downfield I think will translate right away but as far as the short and intermediate parts of the field I think he's a pretty raw prospect still so uh, I, I know it's been the consensus one two three he's been in it essentially since this draft process started but uh, I think there's a chance that he could go in that 10 to 15 range personally uh, and I do think there will be teams that won't have him as a top three wide receiver on their board so I like the over here quite a bit. And, and I think the Chargers are kind of a sneaky X factor here because if they stand pat and take a wide receiver, well, then, okay, maybe that opens the door. They trade the pick and they get a quarterback in that spot. Well, then, okay, maybe that does something else. If they do what maybe RJ was saying, they take Walter or, or an offensive tackle, maybe that changes things there a little bit for a Dunze. So, so certainly interesting. I, I think I would lean over as well. It just feels like there's so many scenarios where that could get pushed down and especially a plus 124. I think I would lean that way as well with you guys. There's a, another pass catching prospect here. Brock Bowers, the tight end out of Georgia. His is 11 and a half over under the over minus 122, the under minus 108. I, I mentioned it earlier. It feels like a lot of mocks had him going RJ to the jets at number 10, even though they do have a bunch of other needs. Do you, where do you view him? Yeah, uh, the market had been circling him around number 12 over the last week. You know, a lot of some, a lot, some places over 11 and a half juiced, uh, some places under 12 and a half juiced. Despite those mocks, like you said, generally putting him 10th. But the odds have lar largely shifted in that direction over the last few days. Circa now has him minus 145 to go under 11 and a half as of Monday. So that kind of more points to number 10. I, I think under is a solid call if you can get a good number. will depend, I think, on whether the Jets have a crack at Odunze. I think they would take Odunze over Bowers if they had both of them in front of them. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens ahead of them in the draft. In, in Emory, I, you know, I mentioned in a million trades. And again, we don't know when these trades or if these trades will go down. But I thought 11 and a half was interesting because let's just say Minnesota does trade with the Chargers, they'd be sitting there at number 11 in need of some pass catching help. So wouldn't that make sense? Yeah, and I've been saying it all along that Harbaugh is a wild card. He could take him at five. I would also keep an eye out for Tennessee. You know, I know they have Chigga Conquo, but again, the best friend to a young quarterback is another safety valve at tight end, especially one that can take a short pass a long way. So you have some options there. Um, even the Giants, you've seen, uh, you know, Wilder kind of, be unsure about retiring and they need another playmaker. Daniel Jones is not the deep vertical threat passer. Uh, Drew Locke is. We'll see if they're giving him an honest, uh, honest competition. But man, this is this is another tough one because you can see Harbaugh taking him at five doing a Harbaugh thing. Um, and you could also see him going at pick 11 with a trade down by one of these teams. So I would stay away from it, but I will say he would probably, he would, he could, if top 15 pick. Is a, is is one of the odds? I will take that as opposed to trying to peg where he's going. Yeah, I don't think it goes six to New York, but it is a little interesting because I mean, you know, Brian Dayball has come up as a tight ends coach. He went through New England with Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez. They kind of centered their offense around the tight end position, so I, that would be fascinating. But again, I don't think that he would go at number six overall. I don't think that would require probably a trade down of some sort. But Proppy, how do you see Bowers in this over under at eleven and a half? I love Bowers as a prospect. I just have a hard time seeing him if he doesn't go to the Jets. I really think that's closer to his floor. I mean, I love the fit to the Chargers. I'm not ruling that out. I definitely get what Emery's uh, saying uh, regarding Harbaugh getting a tight end. It would make a lot of sense on paper. But uh, I ultimately think t 10 to the Jets is his uh, – is his ceiling or the earliest he's like most likely to go if we look at the potential range of outcomes. And if the Jets pass, uh, I could see him potentially going in the mid to late teens uh, with some uh, I like. So if I'm looking at Bowers, I'm more looking to potentially attack him. And RJ knows this very well. Uh, from the long shot perspective, I could see if he ends up slipping past the Jets and he's available in that, you know, 12 to 15 to 16 range uh we could see some teams come a call and trading up for him so uh one team i have my eye on is the philadelphia eagles i think they're a viable long shot 
uh, to draft Brock Bowers in that scenario where he falls. It would honestly be on brand with the Eagles. Uh, we've seen it with Brent Selleck when they drafted Zach Ertz, uh, Dallas Goddard when they had Zach Ertz under contract. They tend, before giving a guy a big contract, uh, to, to draft his predecessor. Uh, so it would make a lot of sense to me. The Eagles are also very aggressive. I believe three of the last four rounds they traded up in the first round. So in the scenario where he falls past the Jets, I definitely would look to uh, the, keep an eye on the Eagles. And I love him. You're getting, I think, uh, 50 to 1 odds on him going to uh, Philly as well. Love that. And in an underrated story as we kind of loom into this draft is Philadelphia's potential need at wide receiver. All the weird stuff going on with A.J. Brown. Obviously, they extended Demonte Smith. Again, if they had to move on from A.J. Brown, Brock Bowers is a great weapon to pair with, with Jalen Hurts. So that would be, again, just a fascinating turn of developments, but not that surprising considering Howie Roseman and this Eagles front office, how much they trade and wheel and deal at the NFL draft. Quickly here, we'll go to the defensive side of the ball. We've talked about Dallas Turner a little bit. This has been taken off the board in, in some spots here, but his over-under at 9.5, RJ, quickly, you know, minus 135 is the over, plus 105 is the under. How do you view him? A yeah, major shift in the odds Monday related to Turner. Latu moved, like I said, to the favorite to go number eight at some books or around the favorite. Last year, we saw Nolan Smith make a similar move for the Falcons around this time. Bijan ended up back as the favorite, was their pick. I think there's some fire to that smoke. Latu would be a beast for Morris. Um, the question is whether Dallas Turner uh, goes number nine to Chicago. So my lean is to the over here. I don't think you'll find a good price at this point. And then if you look at Latu, I think you would take to the under. He's steamed for the under. Teams are comfortable with his medicals. He's the top defender. I have I bet him plus 350 to be the first defender taken. I think that's a real option now that he's favored or close to to go number eight. So you can still find juice on under 16 and a half at him at minus 135 as of Monday morning would play that. And we could buy both of them because the next one was Latu as well. So Dallas Turner, again, nine and a half is over under. Latu, 17 and a half. The under for that is minus 188. So Emery, how are you viewing both of these prospects? And again, is it better off just betting this person first defensive player off the board? It, for Latu, absolutely. For Turner, your question is whether or not he's better than Jared Verse. And I think a lot of teams may have Verse ahead of Turner. So I will take the over, even though it's juiced at minus 135. I feel like Verse will catch some steam and, and make some ground, especially sp uh, stacking back-to-back -back strong years at Florida State. And then, uh, Proppy, how do you view these two defensive players? The, again, the over, Turner, 9.5, lot to 17.5. I think Latu's a lock to go in the top 17 picks. Again, I'd look to attack it as the first defender. I also like his chances of going uh, either eight or nine uh, to Atlanta or Chicago. Uh, so, yeah, I like Latu quite a bit. I wouldn't look to, to, to lay the heavy juice, but I'd look to attack him elsewhere. Uh, as far as Dallas Turner is concerned, I think he is an overrated prospect. Uh, I think he's, you know, he tests really well physically, athletically gifted, but just the production uh, isn't there. I think Latu uh, will will be drafted ahead of him, and uh, I think Turner ultimately falls out of the top 10. All right, good stuff, gentlemen. But before we get out of here, let's let's look at the last overall pick, Mr. Irrelevant, a.k.a. the Brock Purdy Award at this point. The last player drafted, that's, that's the title for them. Let's look at the position. It's not a specific person because that would be crazy if we try to identify that. <laughs> but let's look at the position. Defensive line slash edge is the betting favorite at plus 380. Offensive lineman plus 430. Cornerback plus 550 wide receiver 550 linebacker 7 to 1 running back plus 850 and the list goes on quarterback is 10 to 1 here so RJ how do you view this is this something that you're even looking at to begin with in, in terms of betting or is this something you just stay away from because you just don't know who's going to be on the board yeah, things stay away from it, but if you want to want to do needle in the haystack type of thing, I look for this pick having special teams relevance at returner with the new kickoff rules. The Jets currently hold the pick. Uh, they could be in the market for receiver or running back depth with return capabilities for those players. My lean would be to running back at plus 850. Okay, Emery, do you view that same way? I view it the same logic, but I'm going to the other side. I feel like because you have a defensive-minded head coach and special teams will be the focus, coverage unit is going to be huge. So I will go linebacker plus 700. Okay, Proppy. I thought RJ nailed his take uh, regarding running back. I also think it would be somewhat poetic for it to be a running back, considering the likelihood that, uh, or the unlikelihood, I should say, that a running back is a top 50 pick. It would make sense that we'd see uh, Mr. Irrelevant be a running back since the position uh, seems to be a little bit uh, in the rearview mirror, at least as far as the top 50 prospects are concerned. So let's go running back here at eight to one odds. All right, perfect. And, and I think that's a great point, RJ, to, to, to highlight the fact that the new kickoff rules, maybe some teams will try to identify that in, in the final days 
of the draft, the final rounds of the draft. But that'll do it for this show. Tomorrow we are back with Brady Quinn and Lijay Doosable for a special edition of Doosdays with Brady. They're going to dive into the QB desperation tiers and give you one last lightning mock. For everybody listening to this show, audio only, make sure you download, follow, leave a five-star review, and tell your friends to listen and watch the pod. For RJ, for Emery, for Proppy, I'm Tyler Sullivan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching to the Pick 6 Podcast. We'll talk to you soon.